Why do we love bad media so much? Whenever a popular reviewer makes a best and worst of list, there's a good chance the worst of list is going to receive a lot more views than the best of list. I think it's because liking something is a lot more subjective than disliking something, which is mostly universally agreed upon. Also, saying something is good carries a certain pretentiousness to it. Sometimes it's hard to be open about liking something too, especially if the fans for the thing you like carry a certain reputation, something I'm unfortunately very familiar with. We know when something looks bad. We've all seen bad art, bad movies, bad games, and have heard bad music. You may not know why, but you know it's bad. It's fun to look at bad things and watch how spectacularly something can fail at something it wants to achieve. Often the story behind something being bad is the most interesting part. Stuff like The Room and Tommy Rizal, Sonichu and Chris Chan, and recently with Hunt Down the Freeman, an edgy Half-Life fanfiction that somehow became a real video game you can buy of real money. You fucked up my face. That got me thinking. What's the worst game I own? Everyone knows all the popular bad games. E.T., Bubsy 3D, the Zelda CDI games. Actually, no, those are absolute masterpieces. I take that back. Squad alive, we are off. Anyway, some are even mere download away these days. But what about the games that I own? as in I personally have in my possession or collection. Games I've only played by an emulator, or at a friend's house, or mods to games, don't count. These are happy games I own myself. I started off by looking at my Steam collection. Surprisingly, my collection's fairly solid. I'm pretty careful with what I buy, I'm not a binge purchaser kind of person. Also, I tend to play the same games over and over rather than buy new ones. I don't really have anything that's horribly awful. Dear Esther could be a contender. Dear Esther started out as an interesting Source Engine mod that became redeveloped into a full game. It's what you would call a walking simulator. It was probably one of the very first ones. You walk around and experience a story rather than interact with it. I did have a bit of a jab at this game in my video about third person in the Source Engine. About how boring it is, but this fella left a comment saying he liked it. So maybe it's just not my kind of game. I'll admit the visuals are pretty good for the time. And the story is kinda interesting. The Arrester's biggest problem is that the Stanley Parable exists. The Stanley Parable has a similar story. It started out as a Source mod that became a full game. It could also be defined as a walking simulator. However, it's one where your actions affect the game in a way that's interesting. Really, the story of these two games is a story of Source Engine mods in general. They're either really creative and funny, or take themselves way too seriously and just fall flat. I guess Worm could also count. But I love this game. It looks like a pile of 2004 trash. Once you get past how janky everything is, you have a game that tried some very ambitious things before they were mainstream in gaming. Worm Online and its counterpart Worm Unlimited are both truly sandbox MMO games, where your actions in the game alter the landscape around you. Also, Notch worked on this game before he made Minecraft. I used to take part of raids that consisted of a bunch of people joining the game and messing up the local environment to build a giant shanty town of one tile crap shacks and leaving behind a permanently scarred landscape. And don't get me started on that one time we kept pouring sand on someone else's property because, well, I can't really remember why, but it was pretty funny. And you can do this in Worm, at least you could do it at the time, they probably patched it out after we did it. Truly, the sandiest of sandbox games. I also got this game called Horde for free as part of a summer sale years ago. It's a pretty average game where you just play as a dragon that burns stuff to get gold. It's not super bad, but it's not super good either. I do approve of burning any things though. I don't really have anything that's atrocious in my Steam library, 
So let's move on to the physical realm. Looking for my physical copies, I couldn't find anything that was atrociously bad. I don't know, maybe Skyward Sword could, could be considered bad? Maybe bad for a Zelda game, but it's not horribly bad as a game. Do all these tennis, fitness, and party games count? I haven't even played a lot of these. They're just packing games that came with the consoles I got. How about Diablo 3? I got Diablo 3 at launch. I'm chucking it in here because I feel it's an inferior sequel to Diablo 2. And it's the reason why I'll never buy a game at launch ever again. Unlike Diablo 2, this game's always in line with no option for offline single player. Well, unless you have a console version, I guess. I remember at the day of launch, I had to wait about half a day before I could even play the game due to servers being bombarded by everyone else trying to play the game. The point system of D2 has been replaced by the rune system. I can understand the old system being too complex, but this just oversimplifies everything. Also, I'm pretty sure a lot of these skills are just the same thing with a different light show. I believe the damage is tied to how much damage your weapon does. Meaning the strategic item picking of D2 has been replaced by just getting the one with the biggest number. When you make a new character, you have an option to pick a male or female character, which is pretty cool. But the female characters start off in the undies, which is kind of immature. Also, this game's crammed full of messages telling you to buy the expansion DLCs if you haven't already. Leaves a bit of a bad taste. That being said, I had fun playing through this game again, getting footage. It's definitely improved since launch, but I think a lot of damage has been done. People who prefer Diablo 2 either still play it, or moved on to other games that were more similar. Diablo 3 is just a very different game that wasn't what people were expecting. What about the PS3 version of the orange box? Now don't get me wrong, the orange box is amazing. And this is the version that introduced me to Team Fortress 2 and the Source Engine. But wow, this this was a bad port. Very slow load times between levels and game saves. Rubber banding like crazy when you play it online. And I only ever had one update that I'm pretty sure fixed and added absolutely nothing. The reason why this port was so poorly done was due to Gabe Newell's dislike of the PS3's hardware at the time, which was very complicated to work with. So EA of all people was handed the port. What's interesting about the console versions of TF2 is that they're pretty much a time capsule of the game as it came out in 2007. I mean, a lot of people wax nostalgic about the old days of TF2, but here you go. No cosmetics, no new weapons, no air blast or moving buildings, and plenty of glitches. What about my LEGO games? I've got a few up here. During the late 90s to early 2000s, LEGO made a few questionable choices with their business. They fired a bunch of older designers and hired a new guard who, well, tried to move LEGO away from LEGO. For a while, the only toy lines making any profit were Bionicles and Star Wars. This period of LEGO is generally considered a dark age, and, well, unfortunately this also applies for most of the games. Around this time, we got games like uh, Lego Land and Lego Island 2. We also got games like Lego Rock Raiders. Rock Raiders was a popular theme from the late 90s that's best known for having one of the better early Lego games. The PC game is somewhat similar to Dungeon Keeper, but with a sci-fi theme and then Lego people rather than minions. The PS1 game is different though. It's more of a top-down platformer, I guess? I got this game from a retro store when I was trying to build a PS1 game collection. Sadly, that hasn't really panned out. Based on the screenshots I saw on the back, I thought it would be like a port of the PC version, but no, nah, it's a completely different game. The PS1 version was made by the same developer as the PC version. Data Design Interactive. It looks like they stayed open to about 2012, but only released games up to 2008 or 9 and most of the last titles were just shovelware for the Wii. They're also the creators of the notoriously bad Ninja Bread Man. I like the art on the cover of the disc, but when I put it in the CD drive, it started making a horrible squealing sound.
My game also kept skipping during cutscenes. I'm assuming this wouldn't be the case if I was playing on official hardware, but I don't have a capture card, so emulation is my best bet. The best way to describe this version of Rock Raid is um, a Game Boy game running on PlayStation hardware. You're this little pixel Lego person running around. You don't have uh, any identifying hat or hair on, you can only tell the characters apart based off of what they're wearing. Jumping's pretty wonk. You need to wait for a jump meter to charge up after jumping, or you can only do these little bunny hops. This can get pretty bad, because unless you play a certain character, the water will drain your health. And there's certain sections where you have to jump over pits of water. Also, if your health runs out, you lose access to that character and their abilities. Controlling vehicles is pretty garbage. Unlike your typical overhead game where the direction you point your stick at is the direction your vehicle turns to or moves to. In this game, you push forward to go forward, backwards to go backwards, and left and right not only makes you turn left or right, but also makes the vehicle go forward at the same time, making it very easy to start rubbing against walls. Also in this mission where I had to fly this helicopter, I got stuck in the vehicle with no way to exit, and I ended up failing the mission because I couldn't save this little rock raider here. The music in this version is mostly different from the PC version. There's a few tracks that cross over. We get a full version of the end level screen music from the PC version, which is Kinda cool I guess, but the majority of the tracks are original to this version. I actually kinda like the music, it feels very um, PlayStation-y. I'm kinda disappointed this isn't anything like the PC version. Even a watered down version for PS1 would have been a lot better than this. Okay I'm gonna move on from this game now, I'm sure the longer the game remains on my CD drive the more permanent damage is being done to it. I like Myst. Myst is a good game. The 3DS port of Myst, however, is not a good game. When I first got my 3DS, I also got this game in Pokemon Black, so technically this was my first 3DS game. The creator of this port, Funbox Media, is still up and running. Looks like they mostly do ports and budget titles, you would expect a game made for 4x3 monitors will work well with the 3DS's touchpad because it's in the same resolution, but nope. This game not only uses the top 16x9 screen, it uses images from real Myst rather than the original game. I'm not talking about the Masterpiece Edition either, this is the original real Myst. I don't mind the visuals of real Myst, and I can understand why they use that to get photos of it. But then we get to the controls. Rather than, you know, use the touch screen as a point and click thing, you use the frickin' thumb pad to move a cursor on the top screen. This is such an awkward way to play the game. I'm also playing this on an emulator to get footage, and I have to do the same with a control stick, and it is not any better. The game is not even in 3D. Why use pictures of real mist if you're not even going to use the 3DS's stereoscopic imagey thing to make it 3D? The pictures are also very blurry, making it hard to see some things, especially letters. I can't even read some of these. Some of these cutscenes don't play all the way through, or they don't even play at all. And also they're very heavily compressed, both in video and audio quality. I've tried to... like a little um, typewriter write notes on but it doesn't really work that well. You can only type out individual words at a time, I don't know it's just bad. You can take a screenshot 
but you can only take and store one screenshot at a time. The game, this is the worst game I own by far. It's a shame because I like the original Mist. This was some kid's first experience of Mist, and I feel so sorry for them. Well, that video is hell to make. I've been really burnt out on video games lately, to be honest, and making this video has not helped. In fact, it's probably made things much worse. Ah, it's just, it's fun to watch people play bad video games, but when you play them yourself, you just have like the life and passion for games sucked out of you. I might need a bit of a break from games for a while. Anyway, what's the worst game you own? How did you get it? Why do you have it? Do you regret purchasing it? Do you embrace it ironically and have it as one of your prized possessions? Leave a comment, but don't leave one that's too nasty or else I might get demonetized or something. <laughs>